All right, so finally getting started on this uh, module. We are on module one. This is uh, for crop improvement, module one. And so we want to start out just talking a little bit about uh, the introduction to what crop improvement is, uh, why we do crop improvement, um, and then just kind of get introduced to uh, what is entailed in the whole entire uh, thought process of crop improvement. So, um, you know, some of the reasons that we're trying to improve these crops obviously is going to be so that we can increase yield and, you know, as well as uh, kind of overcome some of these um, disease and insect problems that we might have. Uh, so some of the other reasons that we're wanting to do this, uh, obviously we're going to try and reduce our inputs um, and we're going to do that by uh, trying to improve our fertilizer and water use efficiency ultimately. So, uh, you know, how do we grow crops better uh, without as much water or without as much fertilizer? And I think that as we move into kind of changing about how we're going to uh, grow our crops and try and feed our global population, there's going to be uh, um, push for, you know, greater nutrition. Uh, you might hear terms like nutrient density so that we're growing the same amount of crops, but we have um, a greater nutrient content. So uh, maybe higher protein or uh, maybe there are more starches or more carbs or more sugars. Um, and that's ultimately going to give us, you know, some better flavor. With that, we know that we're going to face these climate change related issues, right? So one of the things that I've been thinking about as we start to, you know, start to increase our global temperature, uh, some of the plants and the crops that we grow require this like cold period or this chilling period uh, known as vernalization. Um, apples are a really good example of that. And so they require a certain time period where they must be cold in order to grow that next crop. Uh, and so if we don't have any of those cold temperatures, what's going to happen to our apple crops or maybe some of our citrus crops? So a few things to look out for. Obviously, with that, we're going to have heat stress. Uh, we know that we're going to run into some water stress or drought stress. Um, and another thing to look for is going to be the salt tolerance. And so, uh, you know, one of the things about salt tolerance is that uh, it, it never, like salt, saltation or salinization never really goes away. And we only add to it. So uh, by the time that we improve these crops to be able to handle uh, this salt tolerance, well, we, we're already increasing the salt tolerance beyond what we bred these crops for uh, so we're going to have to figure out ways to kind of combat that. Uh, no new information here. You know, we know that we're going to need to feed about 9 to 10 billion people by 2050. Uh, and we know that we need to increase those yields as well. And so, you know, one of the things that we'll be looking at is how do we grow more crops on less land? And so uh, this picture kind of gives you an idea uh, of, of how far we've come uh, since like 19, 1986, you know, it used to take about, you know, 1,400 square feet to produce one bushel. And now we're at a tenth of that. We can, we can grow one bushel of corn or we're hoping to grow one bushel of corn in about 150 square feet. So with that, we're going to increase our yield uh, or we can get the same yield with the less land use because we're also running into this thing where uh, we're running out of arable land to uh, grow our crops on. Uh, some of the other ways that we might want to increase yields, and I feel like this was kind of more something that they looked for when they were domesticating the crops were, uh, you know, to make whatever edible part is larger. So uh, to make bigger fruit, let's, let's say tomato, uh, uh, yeah, tomatoes. You know, we want to have a, a, a large fruit uh, so that there's like more of it. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's that there are more edible parts. So uh, that first part is, you know, they're, they're bigger. And so if we have one tomato, it is like the biggest tomato that we've got. Well, that may not always be best. What if we had, would you rather have one big tomato or would you rather have 10 medium-sized tomatoes? So, it, you know, are we going to trade off that size for the quantity? As I just mentioned, you know, we're going to have more plants per area um, and then also to try and kind of get more year-round production 
uh, so that our crops can meet some of those demands. I just want to look at some of the field losses. And again, um, I don't really feel like I'm telling anybody something that, you know, that we don't already know or haven't already been across. But, you know, as I mentioned before, we're looking for those pest and disease resistance. Uh, and then this is really going to, if we can improve, uh, like, the quality of the crop. Like, are we going to, you know, how much do we lose to broken grains or during transportation or when we're storing? Or as they get, you know, packaged, like one of the biggest problems is, is like we really don't have an issue with the amount of food that we produce. So we produce a lot of food. The thing is, we can't sell that food. And so none of that really kind of translates back into bigger dollars because we want the prettiest, we want the best looking tomato to be in our Walmarts, to be in our uh, grocery stores or maybe in our farmer's market. So there may be food, it just might have a blemish or two, and then that's now not sellable. Uh, and you know, and then as well, uh, well, I'm not hungry anymore, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this away. And so uh, there are some things that we're losing along with this, and so that's the reason why those crop yields have to increase to kind of compensate for some of these losses along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, pretty much pest and disease, you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, army worms are starting to become a big thing. We're starting to get changes in our temperature, changes in our climate, which is having an impact on our pest, uh, populations and also their life cycles. Uh, we'll have some diseases that we're still trying to fight. And if we can't, uh, overcome some of those diseases in some of these areas, well, then we stop producing food. And if we stop producing food, uh, then we stop making money. And if we stop making money, well, then we're going to, you know, in a pretty bad situation. Uh, previously, I had mentioned this thing about nutrition. And so uh, one of the things that we'll talk about later on in the course uh, is going to be this uh, golden rice. And um, one of the things is that, you know, in Africa, they had these children that weren't getting enough vitamin A, and it was actually leading them to blindness. And some, some children were actually dying from this. So uh, they, they, they got together, and they started doing these plant breeding. Uh, they started doing some of this genetic modification. And what they did is they took some genes from a daffodil and a bacterium. And what they did is they injected that, or they genetically modified this rice to now produce this beta carotene or pro-vitamin A. And so these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about with crop improvement. How do we get to a better end product that meets the nutritional demand of the population? I don't really think this is going to be a, uh, a quantity thing about producing more than it is going to be a quality thing. So. Uh, this is where you'll hear me talk about nutrient density. Now, whether you believe that there's climate change or not, the thing, you know, the fact of the matter still remains is that we're still getting droughts. So we need to be kind of growing plants that can withstand these uh, environmental stresses. I mentioned before about salt tolerance. Uh, so, you know, we have these tolerant species and this susceptible species and so along with drought tolerance, so we don't have enough water uh, entering our soil. And when you have salt tolerance, what happens is, is uh, the water actually moves out of the plant towards that salt content in order to uh, kind of try and reach some equilibrium, or this is part of this osmotic potential, if you remember me talking about that in soils class. Uh, here, there, you know, this is kind of a demonstration of what happens when we have a drought tolerant crop and we get two weeks of drought. So our soil has actually reached permanent wilting point and these plants can no longer take up water. And so once it gets to that point, even if you add water after a while, well, the plant's already pretty much dead. So it can't, you know, so it can't bounce back. Here we are showing that after a couple of weeks drought, we can see that our plants still look pretty good and they also come back after that. So uh, these are a couple of things where we look at some of those plant physiological properties that are actually helping us overcome this drought tolerance if we can handle 
one or two more days without water, and then what happens after it hasn't rained for a while? It rains a whole bunch, doesn't it? And so if we have a drought, to, you know, if, if we have a drought and then we finally get the water and the plant doesn't take it up, well, then what good is that? Uh, and then over here, we have this vernalization that I was talking about again, where um, if we can breed out that, that requirement for vernalization, then we can start to grow our crops. You know, this is actually a biennial crop uh, that we can only, uh, that we can kind of get back to being a perennial crop or an annual crop. And so these are some of the changes that we're going to be trying to implement into our plants so that we can overcome some of these. So just kind of a backstory, a back history of um, uh, kind of how we got to where we are. Like many of us are well aware that a very long time ago that they had to grow crops in order to eat. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a picture or a, a hieroglyph of uh, at least some sort of cultivation done by the Egyptians. Uh, and so as we start to move into, you know, nomads, uh, they started traveling around and when they found a place that they could actually settle down and grow some crops, uh, they began to like take the best of those seed and through like the process of selection, they would pick the best seed or uh, they would collect that seed from whatever produced the most or the biggest fruit or the biggest vegetable or whatever the crop was. And those were the ones that they would carry forward to replant the very next year. And so as we had this kind of center, uh, we think of it as kind of the fertile crescent, where we kind of where um, uh, it is believed that mankind really kind of started from in the center as people started to move out and they started uh, branching and kind of going off and doing their own thing. They settled down in these different places. And so as these plants started to grow, uh, and, you know, you can see on that chart on the right that there are several different crops that come from several different regions. Uh, and so this is uh, Nikolai Vavilov. And he was this Russian botanist uh, in like the 1800s that kind of went around and kind of developed this idea that these crops really started from a specific center of origin. Um, and so some, you know, some of it, it, it might be nine different regions. I've seen eight, I've seen nine, I've seen 12. Uh, the thing is, is these centers of origin are important because if we want to breed a crop or cross a crop with another crop, uh, we kind of need to have an understanding of where it came from to understand that ecosystem and that environment that it grew in so that we can make sure that we're crossing something that's compatible. Like we wouldn't want to take something uh, from Australia and try and grow that in Alaska. Like those crops are not likely uh, to be grown. It's just the environment's not conducive for that. But we can get some of these crops and some of these centers of origin can give us an idea about what the environment was like, what some of their um, advantages or their adaptability to some of these environmental stresses and that's where we can look for some genes so that we can implement those maybe into another crop and kind of get some advantage or some improvement on this crop. All right, so a couple of methods of this plant domestication. And so uh, we won't spend much time on this part, but as far as when we think about how to, uh, as far as crop improvement goes, how do we get more productivity? How do we get more numbers? Um, and that is really propagation. And so uh, we have asexual propagation. And when I think about this, I'm thinking about something uh, that we can cut, cut, like I think of Dr. Earhart kind of doing this, um, where he's making these cuttings and kind of bulking up or increasing the number of plants that they have. Uh, and you usually do this with, you know, tubers or rhizomes or maybe through some layering or some cutting. Uh, I, I know it's not actually crop improvement, but when I think of this, I think of lantana, 
when I'm thinking asexual reproduction, in, the, in that I can take a piece of lantana and cut that several times and get, I don't know, maybe 50 new lantana plants with that one cutting. One of the problems with that is that there is no genetic recombination. I basically get 50 perfect clones because the genetics are still the same from the mother plant that I cut it from. So that's why kind of asexual propagation doesn't really fit into crop improvement, but it is one way that we can increase those numbers. We just don't really get much genetic recombination so there's really not much variability and everything looks the same and acts the same and has kind of the same characteristics. But the other one that we have is sexual propagation. And so in order for us to um, improve our crops, you know, one of the things that we need to do is cross those and we get what we call hybrid vigor. And so when you cross two crops, you it's possible that you can get some improvement upon that. Uh, and one of the issues with that is how long does that stay there? How long do we get to keep that hybrid vigor before it really kind of fades off? And so this hybrid vigor is the result of genetic recombination. And that's why this is sexual propagation or sexual reproduction for our crops. Now, Particularly for this, it was really kind of hit or miss. They didn't really know uh, if they were going to get this hybrid vigor or not. It was really kind of just a test to see if they would or not. So through that, we've created cultivars. And that is through selective breeding where we have intentionally crossed these crops to, to basically make this hybrid vigor. And so once we've done that, we can create a line that we, that's basically a cultivar that we've created through selective breeding that's produced true by seed. So we know that with this line, we have taken out any kind of, um, uh, kind of what I want to say is like, uh, there won't be any mishaps or there won't be very many mishaps where it's like uh, you might cross two plants and then that offspring, maybe uh, three out of the four, didn't really do what you wanted it to do and you only get one. So they've gone through the process of this genetic recombination, selective breeding to make sure that when you plant that seed, and this is specific, uh, specifically for our row crops. And when I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking corn. We're specifically making that seed or that line to know that every single seed in that bag performs just like every other single seed in that bag. And we can produce that and replicate that multiple times. All right, so one of the things, i uh, just going to touch on a couple of crops and some of the advances that we've made with these. Um, I'm thinking of wheat here. And one of the things, uh, uh, you may have heard of Norman Borlaug. And he kind of started the Green Revolution where... Uh, he was breeding wheat to basically be of smaller stature so that we could minimize this lodging effect. And so lodging is when, you know, the plant just kind of falls over because it can't really keep, it can't really hold itself up right. And so uh, what you, you know, basically when you run the combine through here, you don't get to harvest this little plot. You don't get to harvest this little area because the ground is actual, I mean, um, the crop is laying on the ground and it's lower than the header as you come through that combine as you try to harvest this wheat. So smaller stature is not necessarily uh, going to be uh, subject to the same tall spindly wheat that, you know, a, a strong gust comes and blows this, excuse me, crop over. And then now we've, you know, basically wasted our time and our money and our efforts and our energy. One of the problems with this is that it is self-pollinated, uh, so we don't really get any new hybrids. So you really kind of have to um, uh, go in and kind of intentionally, genetically modify this. And then also we get some of these disease resistance, um, these disease resistant varieties that we can uh, overcome some of those problems with. Next we have corn. 
And one of the things about corn is that it is likely uh, originated from this teosinte, right? This teosinte is this very kind of small, um, uh, spindly. There probably aren't, you know, I mean, well, you can look at it and see that there aren't very many edible parts to this plant or this um, uh, seed head. So over the, you know, over the looks like 7,000 years, we finally started producing these uh, kind of more spiky, kind of more what we expect corn to be looking like. Uh, as we started to grow more, we have the corn that is now starting to get a little bit longer, a little bit bigger. We finally have uh, more kernels that we can actually use in order to uh, eat or make some other substances out of, uh, maybe tortillas. Um, and then like in the 40s and the 50s, we really started getting into uh, getting this hybrid corn that looks like this. We know how we know exactly how many rows it's going to have. We know exactly how many uh, kernels around it's going to have. We know what the crop yield is going to be. We can almost predict it uh, down to a science. And so now that we have this hybrid or this line, we can then start to develop or input more of these um, uh, kind of traits that are allowing us to adapt to the environment. And so, you know, one of these that you might hear about is Aquamax. And so one of these uh, corn varieties, Aquamax would be something that is like, has this drought tolerance. This Aquamax would also have uh, some herbicide tolerance. It might also have uh, some insecticide. It might be BT. And so we're basically throwing the kitchen sink at this corn hybrid as we're trying to improve it. Uh, so ultimately, you know, this is going to be for better yield. Uh, we're going to try and uh, have this herbicide pest and disease resistance, as I just mentioned. And if we get greater yield, uh, then we can start to diversify what we're using that end product for. So instead of it just being to go feed animals or maybe make high fructose corn syrup, uh, there was a real big push for trying to use alternative energy sources. And for a while there, uh, a lot of corn was being grown for ethanol production. Uh, next is gonna be rice. As I mentioned before, uh, we have this golden rice that we've developed. Uh, they're starting to uh, develop more disease and herbicide resistant uh, varieties so that they can um, uh, not have as many uh, uh, kind of the weed pressure or the disease pressure uh, for these rice cultivars. And so rice is going to be, you know, I, I think it's wheat and then rice or rice and then wheat that are like the two uh, top grown crops as far as a food staple goes. Uh, we use those two crops the most. And so developing those superior um, qualities, being able to get vitamin A produced in that rice in those uh, developing countries is really going to help us kind of combat that globally. Uh, you know, we probably don't have that problem here in the United States, uh, but they do in um, other underdeveloped countries. Uh, soybean, soybeans native to Asia, so one of those other cent um, centers of origin. Uh, they started to do some of these, uh, some of this crop improvement to improve yields uh, so that we would get more of those plant parts rather than larger uh, plant parts. Um, this also goes into maturity dates, and so they started changing the way that this plant adapted to different growing conditions, and they bred those to either be, you know, um, a long season or a short season uh, maturity. One of the biggest things that happened with soybean was it was one of the first crops uh, to have this Roundup Ready technology in it where they actually went in and they... Uh, uh, genetically modified the, this soybean uh, to be able to circumvent the shikimate pathway that is what is actually attacked or um, targeted by the herbicide glyphosate. So in 1996, uh, that's kind of when we started getting our first commercially available Roundup Ready soybean. Uh, potatoes. Potatoes are a big thing. They are um, they're highly susceptible to disease because they don't have much genetic variation. Uh, potatoes, again, are going to be one of those 
asexually reproduced crops. And so if you were to cut this uh, particular uh, variety of potato when you went to go uh, propagate it again, and it had this susceptibility to um, this uh, tobacco necrosis virus, your whole crop had it. So we had to figure out ways in order to improve the disease resistance or even like the browning um, and kind of some of the use cases that we have that for. So, you know, one of those big things is going to be disease resistance in tomatoes is kind of why we're look um, in potatoes is kind of why we're looking to uh, use some of this genetic modification, genetic engineering in order to improve these crops. Potatoes are a big staple as well. Uh, they're one of one of the primary sources for starches. Um, tomatoes. Again, tomatoes, as you see, they are native to South America, which is surprising. But um, as they made their way into North America, um, into North America, uh, nobody really cared about tomatoes. They were thought to be poisonous. And so once that was kind of uh, once that myth was debunked, uh, we kind of input this. Um, disease resistance, and also this pest resistance. Uh, and so that is kind of what we're doing in order to improve uh, this tomato crop and being able to uh, require less nutrients, require less water, uh, to have a kind of greater vigor. Uh, we don't have as much um, disease. And we can also get them as uh, cultivars that can like with handle a lot of bruising or kind of rough handling for whenever we are machine harvesting. Uh, as I mentioned before, apple, um, along the way, they've really tried to create more cultivars of apples for different purposes. Um, and so in the beginning, you know, it was kind of used for cider and they weren't really concerned with the fruit quality because like they were just going to end up fermenting it anyhow and making the cider. Well, over time, they realized that it's possible that they can actually use this for other things like baking, right? Many of us are, are kind of used to this or, you know, apple juice or even just regular eating an apple, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And so something that's interesting to see is that uh, these cultivars that we're probably very familiar with, um, you know, Macintosh or Golden Delicious uh, or maybe even, uh, I don't know, Granny Smith, look at the dates of when they were created. So they've kept these popular cultivars of these apples since, I mean, that's almost, you know, 200 years. They've been able to continue this line of apple trees that produce this specific type of fruit. And we know we're going to get that every time. So that's kind of a little bit about how crop improvement has really touched our lives. So as we move forward, we're getting close to the end here. As we move forward, I want to I want you to think about there are a couple of things that go into this. Uh, you'll probably hear me say this multiple times soon. It is going to be phenotyping and then genotyping, and ultimately that is going to give us or allow us to do crop improvement, maybe through genetic mapping or breeding. And so having an understanding of the genotypes and also the phenotype is going to help us improve these crops. So as we move forward into the next um, uh, into the next module, we're going to talk a little bit about genetic diversity and where how we kind of preserve that as we continue to try to move forward because there are the thousands and thousands of plants that we could use and they all have a different purpose uh, but we don't really know quite yet what we need to do with that. So as we move forward, we're gonna be thinking about genetic diversity and you'll hear me talk about genotype and phenotype together along with the environment to uh, improve our crop production. So not only the amount of crop that we're producing, but the type of crop that we're producing and the quality of that crop that we're producing. All right, so that's all there is for module one. I will see you in the next module.